Hello everyone, my name is Derek Bickhart. I am a research microbiologist and bioinformatician with the USDA at the Dairy Forage Research Center in Madison, Wisconsin. Today, I'd like to talk about some exciting research we've done using metagenomics to identify antimicrobial resistance genes and link them with potential hosts. I'd like to structure my talk into four different sections. The first, I'm gonna provide a little bit of background information on antibiotic discovery and antibiotic resistance. Then I'll talk a little bit about some of our recent work on using the cow as a model organism for this study. And finally, how these methods could be adapted to trace the presence and transfer of antibiotic resistant gene alleles in metagenomes. And finally, wrap it up with some concluding remarks. Alexander Fleming was credited with identifying the inhibitory properties of a mold uh, penicillium rubrins on his culture media in 1926. Uh, as he famously said, that's funny, he noticed an inhibitory ring around the bacterial uh, colonies on his plate whenever the mold was present. What he had inadvertently discovered was a beta-lactam antibiotic. Uh, these antibiotics actually inhibit bacterial cell wall formation and therefore result in uh, bac bacteriocidal uh, activity. However, despite this discovery, it was 15 years later that penicillin, which was the active component of the antibiotic, was mass produced. In this case, war was the necessity for mass production. Uh, to give you a sense of the scope and scale, I've provided non-combat deaths on the U.S. side for two major conflicts, the U.S. Civil War and the First World War. Uh, in parentheses, I give the proportion of all total deaths suffered by the U.S. in relation to the non-combat deaths. And as you can see, if you were a soldier, you were more likely to die from disease or accidental death than you were on, by action of the enemy. This was dramatically reduced after the invention and mass production of antibiotics with huge reductions in mortality due to death, uh, due to disease. So much so that uh, several posters at the time were created to show how uh, important penicillin was to the war effort. As you can see, uh, as a mark of the time, this recovering soldier is happily smoking a cigarette in his hospital bed. The, Production of antibiotics was so popular that they were actually prescribed as over-the-counter medication uh, in the 50s, uh, but that would soon change with the rise of antibiotic resistance genes. So as you may have seen from an earlier slide, the first antibiotics were biotically produced. They were produced by a fungus. But why would a microbe produce the means to inhibit or kill uh, other microbes? Recent work that's been published traced the synthesis genes of antibiotics back. And using a evolutionary approach, they determined that anti glycopeptide antibiotics most likely first came around 150 to 400 million years ago. What was interesting though, is that the resistant gene alleles were said to have arrived shortly thereafter or simultaneously. This makes perfect evolutionary sense what you want to do is clear out your competitors using an antibiotic. And since many microbes work commensally and synergistically with each other, many of your friends are most likely to have resistance to the products you produce. And this is a winning strategy. First, um, you may have heard me use the term alleles, and I'd like to clarify that. Uh, when I use the term alleles, when describing antimicrobial resistance genes, that means the modified for versions of their genes uh, that result in different outcomes or phenotypes, as we say in genetics, when expressed. Uh, most antimicrobial resistance genes are studied in the context of human disease. However, they are present in many different environments and many different microbial communities. So I ask you to please keep that in mind. Additionally, Bacteria as well are incredibly diverse. As it turns out, many diverse species of bacteria have innate immunity to certain antibiotics. Other microbes have to engage in active countermeasures, 
in order to destroy or inactivate certain antibiotics. Another evolutionary strategy is if uh, random mutations actually change the targets of the antibiotics, that also provides some sort of passive immunity to them. And finally, in many cases, microbes have evolved efflux genes, which constantly port out these antibiotics so that they never build up significant concentrations within the cell. The development of these alleles in specific species does not preclude their transfer to others. There's a well-known phenomenon in microbial genetics called horizontal gene transfer, which can result in these alleles spreading to other species. I only de detail a couple of these in this talk. There are many more. Uh, the first of which is transformation. As a natural consequence of their eventual death, bacteria will lyse and spill out the contents of the cell, including their DNA, into the environment. Certain bacterial cells are naturally competent and will take up this DNA and incorporate it in their genomes, which could result in the transfer of ARG genes. Another method is transduction, by which a bacterial virus, also known as a bacteriophage, can accidentally take part of the host's genome into itself. This is a, a concept known as specialized transduction. If that bacteriophage infects another cell, it can transfer the contents of that host genome, which will then be incorporated in the recipient and theref therefore give antibiotic resistance. And finally is conjugation. Many bacterial cells have extra chromosomal DNA, such as plasmids, uh, sometimes transposons, that can form circular intermediates and then jump into the next cell. When this occurs, that cell will gain the properties of that plasmid if the genes are expressed, thereby giving resistance. This makes the entire picture very complex because horizontal transfer can result in many different organisms containing the same resistance alleles over time. And by using antibiotics, you actually select for these resistant organisms to proliferate within the community. Adding further insult to injury, if you try to detect a single ARG allele in a system using very standard and easy methods, you might detect it, but you don't know the context. You don't know which organism it might be present within. Furthermore, by using antibiotics indiscriminately, you could eliminate many beneficial microbes that would otherwise take up the spots that a pathogen might exhibit. This complexity has resulted in the need for us to use very complex methods in order to try to identify all the potential players in the community. Um, I, when I talk about the term metagenomics, what I'm referring to is the study of microbial genomes derived from environment, surface, or tissue. But more specifically, uh, and for many of the technically oriented, I'm talking mostly about using DNA sequencing to try to identify the components of these species and communities. To give an example, this is a, a phylogram from a recent work on the rumen from one of our collaborators, just to show the diversity of the different species we try to identify in metagenomics approaches. Furthermore, we can actually take advantage of new technologies that in, result in longer reads and better information on these communities to try to identify new biological facets to them. So in the context of our metagenomics experiments, what we're basically looking for is to identify the presence and prevalence of argaleles in the community. We'd also like to see whether or not there are any bad actors that could actually take up these argaleles and to try to catch them red-handed in the process. And finally, we would like to see also which beneficial microbes would be in, impacted by antibiotic treatment. Uh, do they harbor natural resistance? Uh, these are some questions that we can answer with metagenomics. And in that context, I'd like to present some work that we've done using the cattle rumen as a model for the system. Many people might not look at the cow as a good model for this, but I'd like to point out that many of the improvements in 
dairy cattle production we've made are incredibly important and really marvelous to behold. The cattle production in the U.S. is a huge agricultural success story. And don't just take my word for it. I'd like to present some data. In this graph, I'm showing on the leftmost y-axis the number of dairy cattle in the U.S. Uh, as a function of time on the x. On the rightmost y-axis, I actually show the average milk per cow in kilograms for thousands. Since the 1980s, we've actually reduced the total number of dairy cows in the U.S. herd by 20%. At the same time, we doubled the average milk production per cow, resulting in a net increase in milk despite the lower number of cows. And even though I began as a dairy cattle geneticist at the USDA, um, I do have to acknowledge that most, a lot of this is due to many different advances in different fields. This is truly an interdisciplinary effort. The rumen itself is an interesting organ. It develops from the esophagus of the animal and turns into a large pouch that is subject to muscular activity to move food around. And it's colonized by a huge diversity of microbes. The cow itself is completely reliant on the microbes for digestion of complex plant material. If it did not have the microbes, the cow would starve. The bacteria provide energy and nutrients to the cow through fermentation end products. And after they die, they are passed through the intestine to provide protein to the, the animal. We actually use uh, very limited antibiotics in dairy cattle in order to improve production, one of which is termed menensin. It's an ionophore that is effective against gram positives. By feeding the cow menensin, we actually reduce some of the gram positives and change the fermentation end products to improve milk production. Menensin is not suitable for use in humans. It has high toxicity, so the FDA approved this for use in dairy cattle herds. The rumen microbiome is very diverse and actually includes organisms from all three major super kingdoms. The first of which are the bacteria, which represent half of the biomass of the rumen and are the major fermenters of plant material. The second are archaea, and these are the guys that produce the greenhouse gases that everyone has heard about. And finally are the eukaryotes. There are both fungi and protists that are present in the rumen of the cows. Uh, the fungi do some cellular digestion of plant material, and the protists consume bacteria to pro provide additional fatty acids to the cow. But I guess the question is, why use the cow as a model for this? Uh, there are several reasons. The first is that the cow is incredibly important to US food safety and is important to human health. It can harbor some pathogens that eventually progress down the food chain. So it's of vital importance for us to study cattle. The second is, since we do provide antibiotics for both convalescent therapy and to improve production, the cow is also a great model system for microbial dynamics. And as to the question, why now? We actually have made several huge improvements in different technologies that we can use to study metagenomes, uh, mostly in the terms of DNA sequencing technologies. In order to characterize this, we selected one cow, a cannulated cow, and tried to use as many different technologies as possible to identify differences in the community and identify other biological facets that are going on. So we took a cannula sample directly from the rumen of the cow and extracted the DNA and sequenced it using a short read technology uh, that has been around for a fair bit of time and a new DNA sequencing technology that involves longer reads. Subsequently, we also identified conformational signal using high c a method that can actually identify the 3D structure of DNA within the cell. 
When you first start out with this project, uh, one thing I'd like to impress upon you is the scale. Um, when you're working with DNA, it's literally like trying to solve a million jigsaw puzzles all at once. Uh, but whereas everyone tells you to look at the box uh, to identify the picture and work from there, we have no idea what the sequence looks like. In order to get around this, many clever people have developed algorithms that allow us to piece together all these puzzle pieces together and identify the optimal conformation. These are called genome assembly algorithms. And what it can result in is turning a, a very, a very fragmented picture, such as the one on the left, into something that's much more sharp and provides additional focus on new features. To give you a sense in this community, using the shorter read technology, we eventually assembled 2 million pieces or contigs as we call them. And the long read assembly assembled 77,000 pieces. So even though we've reduced the complexity, there's still quite a lot to dig through. And this is just to show you briefly that the newer technologies do result in improvements. Uh, on the x-axis, I show you the average size, uh, the density of sizes of these different pieces of DNA. And on the y-axis, I've se segregated them by the bacterial taxonomic clade with the bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. You can see in all cases that the longer reads in orange produced much uh, longer contigs as well as a function. What's interesting too is that they also assembled longer viral contigs. And we wanted to take a look at this in more detail. So viruses comprise a series of mobile DNA and they're of great interest in the rumen. Uh, we've actually identified that viral activity may change the metabolic activity of microbes in the rumen, uh, driving sulfur metabolism further. So what I wanted to do is, using the information we already had at hand, I wanted to take the longer reads, overlap them with the viruses to identify the potential hosts for the viruses, and also use that conformational signal I talked about before to also try to find viral hosts. When I ran the analysis, I was disappointed. I had assumed that both methods would find the same thing and confirm the results. As it turns out, there was only 10% overlap between these two methods. In this case, it's very easy to give up, but I was actually quite fortunate to have great collaborators on this project, uh, specifically uh, Max Press of Phase Genomics. Uh, Max told me when I was about ready to give up, he said, no, 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 there's something to look at here. Uh, just continue. And just to stop him from pestering me, I thought, I'll give this another look. At the same time, I was thinking that not all bacteriophage are alike. They have different cycles, uh, that, uh, different life cycles that result in different behavior within the cell. Uh, there are two different classes. Uh, among the popular ones. Uh, one is a lytic phage, which actually exists outside of the cell in a sort of plasmid-like state and replicates itself. And the other is a lysogenic phage, which will enter the cell and integrate with the genome and hitch a ride in the genome of the bacterium. I thought, okay, if Max is correct, only the conformational signal would be able to detect the phage DNA. I would never have long reads that would span the phage DNA and the host DNA. However, the long reads would be the only method to identify the lysogenic phage in this scenario because we could identify where they're integrating into the genome. So I created a network plot in order to visualize this. And just to briefly go over this, each one of the pieces of sequence, the contigs, are a circle or a hexagon, with the viruses being the colored hexagons uh, classified by their viral family, the myoviridae, the sephoroviridae, and the potoviridae. The bacterial hosts are the teal circles. The connections between them are color-coded. Uh, the light blue is detected by long reads. The dark blue is detected by the conformational high C and the red is where it's detected by both. 
And you can see from just looking at all the, the long read links that there are some patterns that emerge. But what was really transformational was when I took a look at the whole picture and saw it very clearly. The myoviridae were primarily being detected in their associations by the high C links. And this actually makes sense. It turns out the myoviridae, many of the members of that family, are lytic phages. So they can only be detected by the high C. Whereas the other viral classes were a mix of lysogenic and lytic phage as well. We derived many different biological features from this, including a confirmation of the sulfur metabolism that viruses drive in the rumen, as well as several different strains of bacteria that they can infect, as well as many different species that could be infected by the same viral strain. This was great and showed a dynamic that we otherwise would have missed. So how do we take this method and adapt it to identifying ARG resistance alleles? We know that the bacteriophage are highly mobile. And since ARG alleles tend to, be, tend to exist on mobile DNA as well, we could potentially use these methods to identify them in different hosts as well. First, we wanted to take a look and see what ARG alleles were in our sample and see whether or not our sequencing technologies can improve the de their detection. So working with uh, another lab at the USDA run by Brad Haley, we classified the different antibiotic resistance alleles. And you can see on the left, uh, underneath each of the plots, we have different classes of antibiotics. And the subset of the plot on the left is for the short read data, and the one on the right is for the long read. It should be very clear at first, the, the short read assembly had far fewer detected alleles, whereas the long read assembly had anywhere from a two to a 16 fold more increase in ARG allele detections, with the exception of amino glycoside alleles. What was interesting too was the magnitude of the tetracycline alleles. This had not been previously reported in the rumen. Given this, the number of alleles, I couldn't use a network plot for this analysis. So um, I used the next best visualization called a heat map. On the, each row is a bacterial genome and each column represents an ARG allele. And the intensity scales from black where there are no high C links or long read links to dark red where the highest links are present. You can see from some of the patterns that there is a lot of sharing of ARG alleles within distinct groups. In fact, when I took a look at the bacterial genomes that were present, they classified into different genera, including the Prevotella, the Clostridiales, and the Bacteroidetes. However, there's a big ocean right here where there isn't really a clear pattern despite clustering and it looks as if there's a lot more promiscuous transfer between different hosts, with several uh, bacterial gene genomes being highly susceptible to ARG allele transfer. So with these technologies, we can track mobile DNA in complex communities a lot better. Some other groups have started using these methods or similar methods, including a group at Cornell that actually found that ARG allele transfer in neutropenic patients was far larger than those found in healthy patients. While I'm hopeful that this technology can be adapted and used in clinical settings, there's still quite a long ways to go in order to increase the turnaround and increase the throughput. But so far, we're making great strides towards using this on a regular basis. So to summarize the talk, I hope that you step away from this by realizing that antibiotic resistance and antibiotic production are two naturally occurring events that occur every day and have evolved simultaneously as an evolutionary strategy for microbes. That means that argaleles tend to be quite ubiquitous in the environment and we must always consider sources for these argaleles whenever we use intervention therapies. Using the cow rumen 
we actually demonstrated that new DNA sequencing technologies can identify argyllial transfer and determine the hosts for these args. And we hope that these methods can be adapted and used in other settings, such as uh, clinical settings as well. I'd like to acknowledge many different people. Uh, there are far too many to list, but among these are many of my colleagues at the USDA, especially Tim Smith, uh, Kevin Panky Bussey, and Kurt Van Tassel. I'd also like to thank uh, Mick Watson of the Roslyn Institute for his advice and guidance on the assemblies. Uh, Adam Philippi and Serge Corin at the NIH. I'd also like to thank our industry partners at PacBio and Phase Genomics, and our academic partners among these were Garrett Suen at UW-Madison. Much of this work has been funded by appropriated funds from the USDA, uh, also from USDA NEFA grant funds as well. And since I've used some, some trade names in this talk, uh, I'd like to state that the USDA does not endorse products or services and that trade names are used for informational purposes. Thank you very much for your attention and time.